the God I never knew. Discovering the God I never knew. I'm going to start with a story. A knock at the door startled Irene Atkins, the 79-year-old great-grandmother was inspecting any visitors. A cautious peek through the peephole revealed a well-dressed, silver-haired gentleman with a kind face that struck her as vaguely familiar. It was something about the eyes and the nose. As she opened the door, her certainty grew stronger. The stranger definitely reminded her of someone. But who? It would take her a while to realize that the man's face bore an unkind, uncanny resemblance to the one she knew better than any other, her own. Irene's 73-year-old brother, Terry, had come for a surprise visit. It was quite surprising because Irene never knew she had a brother. In 1932, in the depths of the Great Depression, a desperate and confused young English couple unhitched their tattered camper on the side of the road and drove away. Police later found three small, hungry children inside. Irene, at 10 months of age, was the youngest. The three were placed in separate foster homes and grew up unaware of the others. Meanwhile, the young couple regained some stability and eventually had another child, their son, Terry. Now, when Terry was 14 years old, the parents revealed their shameful secret to him, how they fell into desperate straits and that the wrenching decision had come to abandon the trio of hungry mouths they could not feed. Shortly after Terry began a long quest, a lifelong quest, to find his siblings, especially the one that his parents named Irene. He searched in vain for almost 60 years. Then came a breakthrough. He learned the name of the agency that had placed Irene and her siblings in the foster homes. Not long after came the day April 3rd, 2010, when Irene Atkins discovered the wonderful brother she never knew. In the discovery, the rootless orphan found answers to questions that she had carried around all of her life. With that story being said, I think that I know maybe a little bit about how, how Irene felt. I was raised in a church, not a Pentecostal church, not a Bible, full gospel church, but I was raised in church. They talked a lot about God the Father. They talked a lot about God the Son, but didn't say so much about the Holy Spirit. Didn't really hear about him too awfully much. And, and most of the time, if it was mentioned, he was just this force out there. And I don't know how many of you are familiar. I think probably at one time or another you've seen the movie Star Wars, right? And it talks about the force be with you, right? The Holy Spirit was kind of just this force that floated around and was, you know, there hanging out. Didn't know much about who he was. So, <coughs> what distinguishes the Holy Spirit? Maybe the reason that I didn't know about him is because I really never looked at him as a person. Not this, this spirit or this force, but I never had looked at him as a person. So what distinguishes the difference between a person and any other thing? Some would say life, right? But a tree has life and a tree is not a person. Grass has life and they're not, it's not a person. So what distinguishes the difference? What makes a person a person? The soul. A person
person has a soul. So, the first notes on here, the first line right here is what I'm going to say is that we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have a soul, a soul is made up of three things. Mind, your will, some of us stronger than others, and emotions. Okay, so a soul has a mind, a will, and emotions. The mind has thoughts. The will has desires, and emotions are feelings. So the Holy Spirit has, because he has a soul, the Holy Spirit has thoughts, desires, and feelings. If the Holy Spirit is a person, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is a person, then the Holy Spirit has thoughts, desires, and feelings. Now, I don't know about any of you, maybe I'm just going to be talking to me and maybe Pastor Bob here, but our struggle, my struggle, is in my desires, my soul. Could it be that the Holy Spirit is trying to help me think like God thinks, desire what God desires, and feel what God feels? Good question, right? We're going to be looking at that. God the Father is speaking. So I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. Well, I didn't put that on our notes, so you get to write this one in. Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. We're going to look and, and look at this idea that God has a soul, or the Holy Spirit has a soul. So in Matthew, I'm going to read out of the Amplified, but it's really going to be close to what you've got there. Matthew chapter 12, verse 18 says, Behold, my servant, servant whom I have chosen, by the way, side note, you have been chosen. You're a servant of God, right? Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in and with whom I, my soul is well pleased and has found its delight. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim and show forth justice to the nations. Did you catch that? My beloved in, and with whom my soul is well pleased. Father God is speaking about Jesus, God the Son, right there. So Father God has a soul. Now, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 38. Matthew chapter 26, verse 38 in the Amplified says this. Then he said to them, My soul is very sad and deeply grieved, so that I am almost dying of sorrow. Stay here and keep awake and keep watch with me. Did you catch that? There was two things mentioned there. Who's speaking? Jesus. God the Son. And he says, my soul is very sad. Emotions, feelings. And I'm deeply grieved. Emotions and feelings. God the Son has a soul. Now, if you go over to Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 38. Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 38 says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. The Holy Spirit has no soul. If we draw back, from him. We're living in we're living by faith, by the Holy Spirit. If we draw back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So number one, let's see.
see, the Holy Spirit has a mind. The Holy Spirit has a mind. So let's take a look at Isaiah 55. I've got down there 7 through 9, but the specific verse that we want to look at is verse 8. Now, I like to put in what comes before and what comes after so we can take it in context and not necessarily just pull out something out of the scriptures, because we don't want to do that. So, Isaiah 55, verse 7 through 9, in the Amplified, says this. Isaiah 55, 7 through 9. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the uprighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have love, emotion, pity, emotion, and mercy for him, and to our God, for he will multiply him in his abundant pardon. For, verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So Holy Spirit has a mind, because in our mind we have our thoughts. We think there. We do that. So let this mind, let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5, says this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. God the Son has a mind. If you read before that, it's talking about everything that Jesus was, and we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. So that God the Son has a mind. Now, if God the Father and God the Son have a mind, then you could stand a reason that God, the Holy Spirit, has a mind. And if Holy Spirit has a mind, have you ever wondered what his IQ might be? Well, I don't think he has an IQ, because if you really put the definition there, IQ stands for intelligent quotient, so it's a formula, right? Holy Spirit definitely has a lot of I, right? He is very intelligent. He knows a lot of things, but I don't think you can put his intelligence in a formula, okay? So I don't think he has that IQ, but he definitely has the I. So think about this. If he doesn't have that, let me rephrase it. He doesn't have a thought like we do. I don't think I've ever heard God the Father say, or God say, it just occurred to me this. Right? I mean, that's what we do. Oh my God, I never thought about that. Right? God is all-knowing. And when you say God, it's not just God the Father, but God, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They don't have thoughts like we do. They know everything. So why is that important? Why would that be something to think about? We have someone inside of us who knows everything about everything. No questions asked. Have you ever thought, well, what should I do? Should I take this job or not? If he knows everything, if Holy Spirit knows everything, why wouldn't we want to know him? He has the mind of God because he is God. Thank you, Lord. And because he is God, we should know him. And the best part is he is living inside of each one of us. Pause. And think calmly about that one. The God who knows everything, 
lives inside of us. So, now I know I've asked the question, so God, should I um, take this job? Should I put my application in? I wish I would have asked it a little bit more. No, I'm just kidding. That's the one I've got now. But, you know, God, should I take this job? Or where should my kids go to school? How about this house, God, or this ministry opportunity? Holy Spirit has a mind, and he is God, so he has God's thoughts. Unfortunately, there is an entire theological system that has reduced Holy Spirit to a force and not a person. If we don't see him as a person, not this ghost floating around, this force, if we don't see him as a person, then we will never develop a personal relationship with him. We'll never do it because we don't think of him as a person. Like I would think of my husband and want to get to know him. Now this is good, so I want you to write this next thing down because you can fill in the blank. He's not a power that you use. He's not a power that you use. He's not this tool, you know, in business, the business realm. He's not this tool that you put in your toolkit or your tool belt to pull out when you use it. You need to use it. He's not a power that you use. He's a person that you should know. Just like you know your parents, your sister or your brother, your spouse, your friend, he's a person that you should know. So number two, Holy Spirit has a will. If he's a person, then he has a soul. He has a mind and he has a will. So let's flip over to Acts chapter 16, verse six. Now here we're gonna see an example where the Holy Spirit exerted his will, okay? So it just kind of lends to the idea that he's got a will. So Acts chapter 16, verse six says this. Now, when they had gone, it's talking about who? Paul. So now when they had gone through Persia and the region of Galatia, they were what? Forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Forbidden. Now, if you look up the definition for forbidden, it is to hinder, prevent, or forbid. In order to do any one of those things, because it's a verb, you have to exert some sort of force to do that. You have to exert your will. The Holy Spirit knew what was going to happen, and he didn't want them. It wasn't time for Paul to go into Asia. So Holy Spirit exerted his will. So since the Holy Spirit has a will, and since Holy Spirit is God, he has God's will. And he knows the will of God. Because, after all, he knows everything. He has the big I as part of who he is. He's intelligent. He, has, he knows the will of God. And, again, he is living inside of us. Of you and me. The one who knows the will of God is living inside you and me. Why wouldn't we want to know this person? I know many of us has asked, have asked this question. The number one question that believers ask, do you know what it is? I bet you can, you can guess. You probably asked it yourself. The number one question is this. How can I know the will of God for my life? How am I going to know what he wants? What's his will for me? You can break it into 
two categories. Okay, the first one is general. The general will of God. What's the general will of God for my life? Well, it's in his word. Right? I want that all men would be saved. I want you to be with me. I want you to be kind and, and generous, all those different things. The general will of God is right there in the Bible. It's written in his word. But the other one is specific. What's the specific will of God? Well, we know that through his spirit. We know that through Holy Spirit. That's the only way we're going to know it. So here's an example. If you want to know how to be married, the Bible tells you how to be a good husband. Right? Maybe it tells you that you're supposed to love the wife. Love the wife. Yep. And the Bible will tell the wife how to honor her husband. That's, that's general. It tells me, gives me specific directions on how I'm supposed to do that. But if you want to know who to marry, then you're going to need to learn how to get to know the Holy Spirit. Because he's the one who has the specific answers for us. Now, I know that nowhere in the Bible does it say Robert Sam Castrova should marry Tina Renee Castle. Nowhere in scripture. Will it, you, you're not going to find it. I don't even think Robert's in the Bible, so. I know <laughs> Tina's not, so. Okay, it's not there. That's a, that, that's a specific thing, right? The only way that you're going to know that is if the Holy Spirit, you ask Holy Spirit, should I marry that good looking boy over there? And he's going to tell you. Okay? He's going to let you know what that specific is. Now, what's amazing about this? Where should my kids go to school, Holy Spirit? Should I take this job? Is this a good fit for me, Holy Spirit? He's going to tell you. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. So what an amazing time that we have. Now let's just kind of look at history. This is an awesome time to be living because if we had lived back in Old Testament, think about it. There were generations that only one person heard from God. One. And there were many generations in succession that never heard from God. And if you look at the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, if you had lived during that time, you would have not heard a thing from God. Nothing. We can hear from God today, right now. You can hear from him. In Acts chapter 2, he tells us, and this is from Job chapter 3, but in Acts chapter 2 he says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Not just one man, not just men, not just women, not only grown-ups, but kids too. All flesh. There's no, there's no distinguishing or breaking into anything. All flesh. Your, what does it say? Your sons and daughters will prophesy. You know, in order to prophesy, you kind of got to hear from God. In order to prophesy, you have to hear God. From God. So he's already telling you. Do you see what it says? In order to prophesy, your sons and daughters will prophesy. That means he's going to be talking to every single one of us. Everyone can know my will, he says. Everyone. All flesh. 
And he says, your young men shall see visions and your old men will dream dreams. So I want to just put this out here right now that Pastor Bob is still seeing visions. So he is not an old man, okay? Yeah. Although a few dreams. But he's an old, he's a, he's a young man. He still is seeing visions. All right, and that's the same for us. Your young your daughters and your sons are going to prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Amen? By the way, you can too. You can too. So I want to point out here that one specific thing that you cannot have a personal relationship with someone through someone else. It's just not a personal relationship if you're having a relationship through somebody else, right? If I were to go to, up to a complete stranger and ask them to go ask Bob where he would like to go on vacation, or let's, let's do something even more personal if we didn't have any kids yet, and I were to send somebody up to him and say, so how many kids do you think you and your wife should, you know, your wife wants to know how many kids we need to have in the family. What? No, we're not going to. We're not going to ask those kind of questions. I'm not going to send this complete stranger, by the way, up to my husband and say, "Husband, where do you want to go on vacation?" The same with God. You don't need to have a personal like relationship with God through someone else. You don't need to go to someone and say, please go ask God what he wants me to do. In the South, I don't know if you heard it so much up here, but in the South, you might hear somebody say, would you go and get a word from God for me? Well, I can almost guarantee that the word that come back from God would be, yes, I want him to ask me himself. Tell him to come talk to me. I'll give him a word. Okay? God wants a personal, Father God, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit want a personal relationship with us. He wants to sit down just like Moses did. I want to sit down and look at you face to face. Speak to you face to face. If you like drinking coffee, he wants to sit down at the coffee table and have coffee with you in the morning. Or sit under the tree and have a conversation, a personal relationship. So one, Holy Spirit has a mind. Two, Holy Spirit has a will. And number three, Holy Spirit has emotions. God has feelings. All right, so let's take a moment to look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 23, uh, 22 through 23. Now it's all, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. These are all attributes of a person, aren't they? A person loves, a person has joy. Sometimes we do have to be long-suffering, okay? We're supposed to be kind and good, faithful and gentle. All of those are attributes of a person. So the fruit of Holy Spirit is feelings and emotions. God has feelings. Now, we're going to go to Ephesians, chapter 4. We're going to uh, be looking at the, the, the group of scripture, uh, verses 25 to 32, but specifically right now, Ephesians chapter 30 says this, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve. Is grief 
an emotion. It's a real emotion. It's a real emotion. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So Holy Spirit can be grieved. So if he can be grieved, then we should ask the question, what would hurt Holy Spirit's feelings? If we're not supposed to grieve him, we better ought to know what's going to hurt his feelings. So let's go up to verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impact grace or impart grace to the hearers, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Yeah. So lying would hurt the Holy Spirit's feelings. Being angry and letting that anger go, you know, through night into the next day. We get angry sometimes. Righteous anger, right? So what grieves Holy Spirit really is sin. We all know that. That's no oh, dang, I didn't know that. What grieves Holy Spirit is sin, not because he's a prude, okay, but because sin hurts people. And Holy Spirit loves people. He loves us, and sin hurts people. So when you sin, he's not angry with you. And you may have that perception. All of this is really thinking about how we see Holy Spirit as person. He's not angry with us. He's not the big guy upstairs waiting to hit us on the head or slap us upside our face. He's not angry with us, but he's sad. For us. So let's talk about grief. What, what, what is this grief thing? Why would he be sad for us? I'm going to use an example of when we lose someone. Why do we grieve? Why do we grieve? Because we lose fellowship or communion with that person. That's what makes us sad. That's why we grieve, because we no longer have fellowship with them because they're no longer here. So the most common example of grief is when we lose a loved one. We don't grieve because we've lost our relationship because they're still our relative. They're still part of our family. So we still have a relationship with them. And in believers, we know that we're going to see them again in heaven someday. So it's not because we've lost relationship with that person, but it's because we've lost fellowship or communion with that person. So I want you to kind of, I hope you're kind of connecting the dots here. When Holy Spirit, when we as believers grieve the Holy Spirit, it's not because we've lost relationship with him. It's not because of that relationship is lost, because what did it say in verse 30? We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of salvation. So let's follow this track. 
If you lose your salvation because of sin, then boy, we're all in big trouble. Okay? Right? Because we sin. We just do. Right? So we're all in big trouble. So it's not, salvation is not based on what we do, but because it's based on what Jesus did for us. So relationship is not lost. But Holy Spirit is grieving because in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, it says this. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light? Is the Holy Spirit light? What communion has light with darkness? Holy Spirit can't fellowship with us when we are walking in darkness. And that's what sin does. How many of you have heard the voice that says, mm, I wouldn't do that, don't do that. And then you go ahead and do it anyway. I had been in such a spot, probably more than once, but this one particular one that the Holy Spirit brought back to my remembrance. I had the Holy Spirit say, don't say that, don't go there. I did anyway. <clears throat> And then later, and immediately, I'm telling you, immediately, something changes. You know. Oh, man. So, I had to go, and I was going to walk, you know, forgive me, Lord. But the Holy Spirit says, you need to go to this person, and you need to go to this person and you need to ask for forgiveness and confess what you did. Really? Me? I'm supposed to do that? I'm, I'm like the pastor's wife. I'm the first lady. I'm not supposed to do that. And I had to make the choice. I had to make the decision to be obedient. And so I did exactly what he told me to do. I went to the person that I spoke to first, and then I went to the person that I spoke about and asked for forgiveness. I confessed what I had done and why I needed to confess. Because I he, Holy Spirit showed me exactly why I needed to do that, because it did this. Okay. And immediately, I'm telling you, immediately, I knew once I had done that, things changed. Now, did did I did Father God, did I did they forgive me when I asked for forgiveness? Absolutely. Forgiveness is there. If we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if I had not taken the step that Holy Spirit told me to take, then it's like strong arming him and saying, oh no, I don't think you know what you're talking about. It's insulting him. He knows exactly what we need to do. He has the mind of Christ. He knows everything about everything. His job, his job is to teach us everything and lead us in truth. Once I humble myself, once we humble ourselves, changes everything. So how many of you have said, 
Father, forgive me. I will never, never do that again. And then you do over and over and over again. That's what grieves Holy Spirit. Not that we fall, but what sin we fall into. Because he knows we're going to fall. He knows us. That's what the sin we fall into. He knows that sin will hurt us. And he loves us so much. Father sent Holy Spirit to help us in every single area of our lives to have victory over those things that bind us and hold us down. He wants to set us free from everything that hurts us and hurts the people that he loves. Knowing the Holy Spirit as I know him, I know that he's been speaking to you today. Ever so quietly and gently. And I want to say if there is something that Holy Spirit has put his finger on, I would say don't strong arm him. and say, I don't need to take care of that. He's putting his finger right there because he wants to set you free today. He wants to take that thing completely out of your life, break those chains and those bondages so that he can have full fellowship with you. So that when you Pray and ask to hear from him. You'll hear from him. Clearly, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you will know what the will of God is and what his specific answer is. So I want to give you that opportunity right now to come on up and to lay it down on the altar and give it to him and allow Holy Spirit to set you free. Also, if there's something that's kind of outside of what I talked about today, maybe there's an issue that in your life. I don't want us to neglect the opportunity we have. Do you feel Father God here? He's here right now. And he wants to meet whatever need you have. So let's stand. And let's, let's come on up and give Holy Spirit opportunity to minister to you. This is a family, and I know just like uh, the Word, God's dealing with all of us about certain areas in our life, so let's not be shy. Come on, we all have some areas in our life that we've not said yes to the Holy Spirit. Let's not be afraid of that. This is uh, family time. This is time where we can make things right, so you just come and, and let Tina pray for you, or come down and kneel down at the altar and just ask Father God uh, to forgive you, and tell the Holy Spirit you're sorry. And that you'd be more obedient to listening to the Holy Spirit in your life. Hallelujah. There's all, let me read this one scripture to you. After Ephesians chapter 4, this chapter 5, it says, um, 
Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So maybe today you can be a fragrant offering to God. Say, God, I just want to be a fragrant offering to you. I just lay my life down again so that I will walk in the power and the love that you give intended to me to let the walk in. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness this morning. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We recognize you leading us and guiding us. And help us again, as David said. Don't take your spirit from me. Help me not to grieve you, Holy Spirit. Help me to live a, a righteous life. I can't do it on my own. I only can do it through the power of your leading and your guiding me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we praise you and we glorify you. We thank you, Jesus. And we especially thank you this morning, Holy Spirit, for helping us to be more righteous, to be more obedient, seeking your guidance in our everyday lives, because that's what you're here for, to illuminate God's word to us so we may understand it, to keep us from sin, Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for helping us, for being our helper. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. The Spirit's going to only speak what he hears from the Son and hears from the Father. He's not going to speak anything of his own will. He's going to speak what he hears from the Father. And Lord, we thank you for that today. Father, I pray your blessing on each person that is here today. God, I thank you that you are changing us into the very images of Christ so we may be so that we can be your light in this world. And Father, guide us not only in the things that we have to do every day, but guide us into those that need to hear your word. Empower us to do that, Lord. And we thank you for that. Bless your people, Father. Strengthen them for your journey, for their journey. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. If you want to